Assalamualaikum, uh, everyone. Welcome to um, our conference. Is uh, our topic is mental illness in children and data collection. Uh, our speaker today is Dr. Fatima Yasmin Alam. She's a specialist in child and adolescent psychiatry. She's currently working as an attending child and adolescent psychiatrist at New York City Children's Center in USA. Formerly, she worked as a clinical assistant professor at State University of New York, Downstate Medical Center, where she had a child psychiatry fellowship. Uh, she started her medical education at Chittagong Medical College in Bangladesh. And then after the first year, she left for Bulgaria to continue her studies at Medical Acad Academy in Sofia under a Bulgarian government scholarship. After graduation, Dr. Alam, along with her family, migrated to USA. Here she had her externship in psychiatry at Jamaica Medical Center, New York, and psychiatry residency at Maimonides Medical Center in New York. She has been living and working in New York for more than 30 years now. She's married to artist Masood Al Masoodul Alam, and they are blessed with one daughter and one son. Her hobbies are singing, especially uh, Romindra Shongit, cooking, baking, and making jewelry. Uh, so, Dr. Alam, the screen is yours. Okay, thank you. Thank you for inviting me, uh, and thank you for the introduction. Um, so, we are here today to talk about child and adolescent psychiatry. So what I think I didn't really prepare for any like specific topic, for example, like depression or ADHD, anything like that. I think it's, it's better to talk about some, you know, like over uh, give an overview of child psychiatry, how child psychiatry works and how basically we do, um, we do, you know, diagnose and, and, and make treatment plan for the children. Right. So uh, like you said, I'm a, I'm a child psychiatrist. Uh, I'm a child psychiatrist in an inpatient unit. I work in an inpatient unit, and uh, this is a state hospital. So basically, I get all the patients from the acute care. When the child goes to the acute care hospital, if they cannot get better within, like, let's say, two, three weeks, they basically, you know, send them to us. And then in our, in our program, we are, like, more comprehensive, like, you know, more uh, there's a, a lot of services for the children in the hospital. So they get admitted in the inpatient unit, and they get services from like, you know, uh, medication management, um, uh, individual therapy, group therapy, they also get to attend the school according to their academic level. And, um, and when they get stabilized, we go, uh, we, we discharge them either home or what they're coming from, or if we think that the child is not ready for going home, we can do the step down program. Like uh, uh, some people can go to the residential placement they can get like you know, a little bit more treatment more uh, therapy and then they can go home or foster care or whatever they're coming for also we do like day treatment program uh, meaning that uh, we can discharge patient to uh, their like parents or the foster care and then they can come to a day treatment program from like um, 8 to 2 30 and then they go home basically it's patient to um, uh, intensive day treatment program, meaning like if I think the patient is doing good, but I don't want patient to go home and, and have it relapse. So there's like 45 days program we can send them. So basically I have a lot of luxury to get a lot of services for the, for the children, uh, you know, compared to the other, other acute care or, or private sector. We also can provide, uh, children with like, um, uh, uh, like home services, ICM worker, like intensive care management, those kind of things. Okay, so um, what kind of patient we get? We get like all kinds of patients, like our hospital covers from uh, the youngest is seven and maximum to eight, 18. When they're 18 years old, although they're still in under care, we send them to adult facility to continue treatment there. I work with the, um, I work, my, my um, patients are from 14 to 18. And uh, I work with the patient, um, like it's a co-ed unit, girls and boys both. So I get to see like a uh, different kind of um, clinical presentation. We have patient bipolar disorder, we have patient with conduct disorder, with, uh, you know, uh, with ADHD, and then we have schizophrenia, and we have so on and so forth, like, you know. 
So, um, so here, I, I, let me just um, discuss about um, how we gather information. I said data collection, so it's like it's a broad, you know, umbrella. So data collection, I want to say that, like how you get the information from the parents, how you get the information from the teacher, how you get the get you information from the patient, and the other is other, you know sources. So um, the way the interview or you can say that a collecting process start when you see a patient, right? The patient comes to you. Uh, I'm going to, I'm going to say it not for the, not only for the inpatient unit, it's like, you know, the general practice, how you collect, how you interview, how you um, uh, develop a treatment plan for a child with a mental illness, right? So uh, we get patient from um, in the clinic, let's say, we get patients from all kinds of sources, right? Uh, sometimes it comes from the parents. Sometimes it comes from the school or foster care or who is the you know, legal guardian of the child. So when the child comes to you first, you have to um, get the consent from the, from the mom, dad, or a legal guardian if you are allowed to talk to the patient or if you're allowed to you know, interview the patient here, right? I mean, I'm, I'm talking about in USA. Uh, so after that, then you can start gathering the information. So basically, you have to see what kind of information you're getting, and who's who's the you know source of the information. You can say that I gather this information from the mother, from the child, and the referral uh, person. Let's see from in another inpatient unit, or or um, let's see from school, right? So um, the way we do it here, um, we meet the parents separately first. And then you also can, um, if the parents say okay to meet the child separately, you can do that too. And especially for the little, little ones, right? Sometimes parents, they don't like you to meet the child without them, right? But you have to respect that. And, and of course, we, we see both, them both together. The scene together, the parents give you the idea uh, that family dynamics, right? How the parents is interacting with the, uh, with the caretaker, right? Okay, so so after that, that you ask the why, why mom, why did you bring your child here? So we call it cheap complaint, right? Then so it's very important, right? Then maybe the mom or dad or the caretaker can say, oh, my child was not sleeping for um, whole week, not eating, not, not, um, uh, not talking to anybody things like that, right? And also sometimes they can say, oh, my child is cutting themselves, like self-injurious behavior, right? Then you take from that, that's the chief complaint that my ch child is cutting. And then you study the history of present illness, meaning you have to be very careful to taking the history of present illness, meaning that that's your main information basically, right? So you can ask um, what happened and um, for how long this has been happening and uh, explain me why, how do you find your child? You know, then when they explain why they're here and then you have to ask that, you know, did you see any other doctor before you come to us? Who did you, who do you see uh, why you're here, right? And then they can tell you that, oh, I went to my pediatrics, or pediatrician or my primary care and then my doctor thing, I should see a psychiatrist. And then you get all the information, right, from there. Um, I'm gonna go back also a, a little Later, what the way like after after his two prisoners, what I or what we ask, and then um, and then I'm going to explain more. So after that, you also have to uh, get the information past psych history. Meaning, is this the first time the child having that, or the child had problem before, uh, similar thing, you know, or your child was admitted anywhere like in psych admission, uh, and then the child was given any uh, medication by anybody. And then um, is the child, it was seen by any psychiatrist or psychologist or social worker, things like that. After that, you also um, uh, have to get a developmental history, which is including, um, uh, you asked the mother about the pregnancy, how, pre how was the pregnancy when the child was you know, uh, conceived? And then also you have to be very careful to get this information because sometimes moms are very, very sensitive when you ask many questions, but you have to say like, um, I have to go through because this is our, this is our, you know, process, you know, this is the question that we ask everybody. It's not only for you. We ask any parents that come to us, we ask some yes. questions. So we can, uh, we can ask the mom, 
um, was she smoking? Was she drinking? Was she, if, if, you know, using any drugs? Is there any history of, let's see, there's a child comes with a tick disorder, meaning like, you know, child has different like vocal tics, especially. Then you can ask the parent, you know, the caregiver that was a child any any time was diagnosed with um, uh, step throat and things like that. There's like, you know, symptoms called panda. Uh, what can happen for many children after uh, you know, throat infection, they had a, they develop, you know, uh, ticks. After that, you take the social history, meaning like uh, who, uh, I mean, who's the, you know, caretaker is the bio mom or foster mom, who the child is living with, who's in the home, and how's the relationship with the, the child at home with the mom, dad, and other siblings. Uh, then And then you take the family history, family medical history and family psych history. Family psych history is very important. You you have to directly ask, is anybody ever tried to um, commit suicide? Anybody has history of depression? Anybody has history of schizophrenia, uh, ADHD, and other mental illness? Many times they're going to say no, no. Especially, um, 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 especially people uh, from Asian especially um, Bengal, Bangladeshi, Indian, and Pakistani, sometimes they have some difficulty understanding mental illness. For them, mental illness is like, you know, you're crazy, you're running around the street, you're not, you know, wearing any clothes, things like that. But then you have to like, you know, break it down. You have to, you have to ask um, anybody has depression, anybody has like, you know, attention deficit, hyperactive disorder, anybody has anxiety, because for many people, those are not mental illness. I'm gonna give you an example. Um, I had a patient, Bangladeshi patient. Um, she keep coming back again and again to a severely depressed child. We, uh, we teach the child and we share them and the child keep coming back home. And the material that I got from um, the acute care hospital, they say no family history of mental illness. And um, although I, I speak Bengali and everything, but we, uh, legally we cannot, like I cannot directly um, uh, interview the patient in uh, or the family in Bengali. We have to have a translator there. So um, the, when the patient came back second time, then I said, let me go beyond, you know, that I, so I told the translator, let me ask a few questions. Because I noticed that whenever I ask question to the, um, uh, the translator, she's not really translating the way I want her to translate. So I told mom um, that, um, I'm going to tell you in Bangla, Bangla is, listen, I say, তো <laughs> From that point, I actually like whenever there's a Bengali patient or Indian or Pakistani, like, you know, I try to go that way. I ask them differently, except like, you know, uh, I mean, um, except them like asking, oh, anybody tried to commit suicide, anybody had mental illness, not like that. Then I go like Monkara, like that. Okay, so that's very important to know, you know, know all the information. Then, then we, after that, actually, we're able to change the whole whole treatment plan, we, we uh, were able to do like a lot of family therapy with the whole family and everything. Actually, the patient did better after that when we get to know the child better and we get to know the history better, okay? All right, so after that, uh, okay, that being saying, so also it's important to take the family medical history because we have a lot of kids uh, uh, comes with diabetes or pre-diabetic. And, and also if the patient is coming, already coming with the medication to inpatient unit, a lot of, you know, antipsychotic medication can cause, you know, um, syndrome, which can cause diabetes. So it's very important to be careful when we treat a patient with, uh, with antipsychotics. So it, it helps us. Okay. All right. Being said that, um, after that, we also ask about uh, abuse and neglect. And this is very this is very sensitive. Like and many times parents don't want to tell you about ACS involved in that case. ACS means like Children Protective Services is not involved. Many times they're, they're not going to tell you about any physical abuse or sexual abuse. So, but 
uh, you know, you can you can ask the child directly. You can ask the parents directly. Is there any you know physical or or sexual abuse? Many kids here in this country is like you know, even very young age, even seven eight years old, they start smoking. Let's say the parents come. And parents has substance abuse disorder. The parents cannot take care of the child. The child starts smoking too, very young age, like marijuana and things like that. Okay, also then you ask about the education. Um, also like getting an um, overview about child's education is very important. Then you, you get to find out how the patient is functioning at school, right? Many times the child has learning disability, but was not addressed. The child can be very irritable, very angry, self-abuse, including self-abuse, you know. Abuse. So you have to be careful to ask all the school or not. Here in this country, um, if you if you uh, find a child is having trouble at school, learning, then you get to get evaluated. All right, and another thing after that, you have to ask uh, about sexual orientation of the child. I mean, I'm not sure in Bangladesh you can do that, but here, even in our forum, there's like, you know, say, uh, parents, they don't know about it. Many parents know about it, they're okay with it, then I will ask the question. If not, like uh, you can ask the child separately. So if the, what is child, he's a boy or girl. If the child has already, um, you prefer to, you know, uh, have relationship with boys or girls, you know, nowadays there is another thing that we have. It's just something new for us too. It's called non-binary orientation. Meaning, let's see, I'm I'm born as a woman. I'm a woman, but that child can say, uh, "I'm not a man. I'm not a woman, but I'm everything." Okay. So today maybe she thinks that she's a woman. Tomorrow she thinks she's a man. So that's also normal, acceptable, right? We call them non-binary, right? And so, uh, and then there's like many, many term, many, many um, section of that. I'm not going to go through that because it's going to be really difficult for even people here who is not in psychiatry, difficult to understand. It's every day there's something new about the sexual orientation and sexual, you know, sexual, gender identity, gender um, dysphoria, all kind of things. It's like a huge, huge area of uh, psychiatry. Okay, and then you go to the religion, race, cultural background, um, um, and the legal history. The legal history, like many kids, even they like 15, 16 years old, but, or they have, um, you know, disruptive mood, disruptive mood dysregulation disorder. They get, in, you know, involved in fighting, uh, hitting people so badly, then they get, they can get arrested and they can, you know, go to juvenile ju detention center, detention center like that. Okay. All right. So I'm going to take a pause here. Anybody has any question? No. Okay. So, I mean, is it clear what I'm trying yes, to say? Okay. All right. So I'm not sure how Bangladesh works uh, because I, yeah, I, 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 I'm like, I, I, my training is all like, you know, US and European training. So, I never work in Bangladesh and I didn't go to Bangladesh for many, many years. So I'm not familiar with it. So, I mean, if you have any, any problem understanding the process of data collecting, you can ask me questions. Okay. All right. So after, after, um, after um, collecting all this information, we do like mental status examination. In psychiatry, mental status examination is equivalent to physical exam. Like let's see, um, in pediatrics, let's say a, a patient comes to you with the fever, sore throat, stomach ache, and then then you check the child, right? Uh, for us, of course, we do we do a physical exam. Our we have a pediatrician in the in the in the team too, so the pediatrician can check for those like you know vitals and everything. But for psychiatry, we we do mental status examination, meaning um, we will start um, looking at the child, how the child is, you know. Uh, you know, presented to you. You can say 16-year-old um, male, look disheveled, poor personal hygiene, 
So it gives you a lot of either frail or obese or looks older than stated age or, or looks younger than stated, this kind of things. It's give you a lot of information because many times, let's see, the child is like, you know, it looks to, you know, neglected, right? Uh, especially the younger, younger one, like let's say six, seven, eight years old. The child is not clean, wearing dirty clothes and, you know, you, you, you said there's something something with the child and then you take your interview from there. Okay, that's one thing. And after that, you see if the child is presenting with any abnormal movement, meaning like, you know, normally we don't, we don't really move too much. If the child has ADHD, child is fidgety in the chair, child is like getting up and down, not sitting in the chair, going here and going there. And sometimes, the child has autism being other things. Or let's say the child has um, facial tic, you know, which tic disorder, we'll see a lot of, you know, grimacing, a lot of shoulder shrugging, a lot of like, you know, make, fa you know, facial tic, things like that. After that, you, 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 you find um, if the child is making eye contact with you, Sometimes kids are like depressed and has also history of neglect and abuse. They, they have poor eye contact. Also let's say the child is psychotic. Also we get to see like poor eye contact. Okay, so it's very important. And after that you, you ask the child how the child is feeling. If the child is depressed, happy in his own language, you can, you can say, hello, um, how are you feeling today? The child can say, oh, I'm depressed or I'm okay, I'm happy and things like that. And then you, you say his affect means how you find him, right? Affect means, um, mood means how I feel and I can tell you that's the way I feel. My affect is like how you find me. Let's say I'm happy, but I'm crying. Then you can, you can say like it's not congruent, mood congruent with like, you know, you can say the child's affect and Mood is not matching, right? Then you find something. And so, and the, the child having like, let's say, especially psychotic patient, you have flat affect, meaning like there's no reaction in the face. The child is like not, it, it expression is very flat, okay? And after that, um, um, so you, you go through this, like, and then you ask questions about um, the, if the child knows where he is or she is, the date and uh, what's the today's date, what's, what's kind of season outside. So you, you actually finding like the child is like, you know, um, within meaning like child knows what's happening around him. The child knows about the date, month and season and, and the child is recognizing the family that the child is coming with you know, and came with and this kind of things, okay? Uh, after mental status, um, basically, like you know, um, then you you develop your your uh, treatment plan, uh, depending on the you know um, presenting um, you know history of present illness. So let me go back. Remember when I start first? I'm going to say history of present illness. So there's actually this is the this is the place where you get uh, all the information regarding your diagnosis. Mom can say, okay, my, my child cannot sit in a chair. He's having constant problem at school. I'm getting called by school every day. Um, the teacher is complaining that he's all over the place. He's not sitting in the place and he's having problem concentrating, right? And then you go for how long this, can, this has been happening. So it's, you know, all the, all this in psychiatry, all the diagnosis goes by the time period, right? Sometimes let's see the ADHD can happen. Let's see if child has have any physical issues, right? If child is not feeling well, the child is sick, they can have uh, those issues like restless, don't want to concentrate, the child is cranky. So it's very important to get all the information in, including the time for how long, when, is, is anything happen? Like, you know, sometimes let's see the trigger. What's the trigger? Like, you know, find the trigger. Sometimes it happens. So is there any loss in the family? The child is getting uh, abused by anybody, things like that. Okay, that's about ADHD. Let's see if you're, um, if the mom or, or the caretaker is saying that, oh, the child is not eating well, he's in his room all day, not talking to anybody, not sleeping well, and, you know, and looks depressed and crying, cranky, irritable. So you, you go, and the same way you go for how long, uh, how do you find your child? Uh, is your child telling you that the child is feeling depressed? 
and for how long that's been happening. So you go from there. And so whenever you ask, ask about depression, you always like, you know, you automatically ask about um, the other side of depression, right? Which is which called mania. So um, then you say, okay, so, I, I, so you're telling me that your child is uh, depressed and um, uh, not eating, not doing well. How about, did you find your child like, you know, uh, up for uh, like several nights, not talking a lot, very pressure speech, doing a lot of things, going out, sexually inappropriate behavior, things like that, that's called mania. So here I'm trying to, like when I ask this question, here I'm trying to rule out bipolar disorder. You know, bipolar disorder means like two, two kind of uh, mood symptoms, like one is depression, one is mania. So in order to diagnose bipolar disorder, those kind of things has to like, you know, um, uh, the depressed mood has to happen more than two weeks. And the mania, like the, the, um, the way I'm explaining it, it has like more than, a, more than a week or so. But in order to diagnose bipolar, one mania, one manic, manic episode, you can, you can say the child will, will be bipolar disorder. So, but the time frame has to be manic episode more than, more than a week. So you do the diagnosis. And of course, always you ask the child and the family if the child is hearing voices, regardless of the history of prison and whatever they come with, but you have to rule out those things. You have to ask those questions to rule out bipolar disorder. You have to rule out um, 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 ADHD. You have to rule out psychosis. You have to rule out conduct disorder uh, and, and another psychotic disorder, okay? So, and then you ask if the child is, um, Mm, hearing voices, seeing things that other people don't see. And also uh, sometimes the child is going to say no, no. But if you, saw, if you see the child is like, you know, internally preoccupied, meaning it looks like the child is like not, not responding to you. It looks like the child is responding to some inner, inner stimuli. Then you, you, um, you ask the parents that, did you see your child ever talking to themselves, laughing to themselves inappropriately or uh, making gesture and things like that, okay? Um, and then you, you take all the information and you, you develop, you know, treatment plan according to a presenting problem. All right. Okay. Anybody has any questions? Anybody there? I don't see any questions. Okay. All right. So I, I, I actually want to do it like as interactive. So, I mean, so far, that's what I want to say. I mean, I don't want to go like this is one by one because then it's going to be like too many or two for one day. I mean, I, I'm, not, I'm not sure if I was able to um, give you like overview of a data collect collecting, you know, process or, or present a case, you know, if you, if you, if you, in your practice, did you ever get any case like that? You know, so we can, we can discuss that. Uh, I have a question. Um, now with this COVID, um, with this shutdown, are you seeing what sort of uh, health, mental health issues are you seeing right now? Okay, so um, there's like two kind of, two, two group of like, you know, a patient population. One that let's see, I'm dis I discharged somebody uh, three weeks ago, right? The child went home without patient follow-up. Unfortunately, all the outpatient follow-up is, you know, telepsychiatry. So meaning like they're like, even in, for the day treatment program, meaning they're, home, they're staying home and somebody's calling them like therapist or psychiatrist and check on them. The child is home all day, not participating in any school program, not participating in any group therapy, not participating in any kind of like, you know, activities they're supposed to go. So they're falling, they're having relapsed too quickly, like, you know, and, and they become angry, irritable at home. So, and we see many returns, like, you know, Oh, okay. Um, you you discharge Miss Miss John Doe, but Miss John Doe becomes suicidal again, starts scratching and saying that I'm going to kill myself and I don't want to take my medication, and then try to tie something around her neck. And then mom took the patient to the ER, and then patient came back to us. That's one kind. Another kind of patient that we are seeing in the clinic because I'm in my my facility. We have we uh, I'm in patient. We also have outpatient clinic. We have day treatment program, like I said, and we have also intensive day treatment program, like four. So we are in the clinic. We are seeing new cases, a lot of anxiety, anxiety and depression. Many like child is getting um, 
getting very anxious. They think they're never going to go out. They never can go to see their friend and they're at home. They're very cranky. They're irritable. You know, those kind of anxiety and depression we see. Also, <clears throat> excuse me, child abuse is, you know, up. Especially kids with special needs, the, you know, special needs kids with, uh, you know, autism, with um, with a developmental delay, they are getting more, more, you um, abuse because you know they let's see the child has a developmental delay and the child goes to special program all day there and they take care of the child and they, the child came back home in the evening meanwhile mom is not i mean mom can do it but mom is not um trained to do so many things that they they get all the services in the in the in the you know in the program so there's like also they get frustrated they can abuse the child so we, we get those kind of things including the parents also getting anxiety anxious and depressed too because there's like for example for in new york like we just started to getting like oh, you know a little bit like we started opening all the programs and everything outpatient i'm talking about outpatient and day treatment but then now it's spiking again so they're all closed the school is closed the programs are closed all telepsychiatry and also patient uh, when you send a patient to intensive day treatment program that i said idt especially patient who has suicidal you know attempts uh, uh, or cutting behavior before is rising up because they are not going to the program. So at home, they don't know what, how to, you know, help themselves is going up. We see that kind of, you know, patient a lot. And insecurity, you know, they don't know what to do. What's going to happen tomorrow? Any other questions? You can even write your questions if you want. Uh, thank you, ma'am. Uh, am I, can, can you hear me, please? Yes, yes. Okay. So thank you, ma'am, for your nice lecture. I'm Dr. Fahim Iqbal from Dhaka Medical. Hi, uh, how are you? Hi, I'm fine, thank you. I just wanted to ask, uh, uh, to diagnose autism and in, in very <clears throat> early years, like in infant or like one, two, three years, uh, what can the general practitioners like look out for uh, to okay, diagnose so autism, autistic disorders in the very early age? Okay, and so- Thank you. Okay, so autism is is like you know here the way we uh, we do autistic um, diagnosis of autism disorder is a big process, right? So many people get involved. So the first, actually, of course, the, all these uh, parents told uh, tell the um, their primary care, right, like pediatrician that oh, my child is not um, not like you know playing with the other kids. That's the first complaint. My child is not hugging me back. My child is not making eye contact with me. And then uh, many times they can, they're gonna say, my child is cranky. And then my child is having problem with noises, right? And then loud noise they cover. So then the, uh, when, when they go to the pediatrics like, like that, and they, um, um, so then they refer the child to you know, a neurologist, like, you know, it's, it's, a, it's a long process. Like, you know, like person like me, I don't really diagnose autism. Uh, by myself, because there's a um, neuropsychiatrist, neurology, and all the medical workup has to be done. And there's a special uh, the psychiatrist, they're uh, specially trained to diagnose and evaluate those children. And uh, they, they do a lot of testing. They do um, all medical testing. They do, uh, they'll do all, all neurological testing. They also do the genetics, everything. And then the child get diagnosed. But the first symptoms that parents always, and, and most of the time I can say, they, they come with those kind of complaints. Like I said, uh, not socializing, not looking to anybody, not you know hugging back, no, no, no emotion showing, things like that. Thank you. Uh, I have another question, if you don't sure. mind. Uh, I don't so, <laughs> Yeah, thank you. Yeah. Uh, so uh, this COVID situation, as Dr. Wasim Hafiz uh, properly said, the COVID situation for the last one year, uh, do you think that it will have a like long impact for the for the children in this one year they are staying in the house? Because one of my uh, one of my uncle, he's, he's he has a little baby, uh, he is mm -hmm. complaining that. His baby is like behaving a little strange when now he, the school is open, but uh, he doesn't want to go to school because for the last one year, only he was with his parents, no socializing with other children and something like that. So what kind yeah, of social impact will it have? Okay, so that, that uh, it looks like, although I don't know, when you say the, uh, he, the child is uh, behaving strange, so what does it mean strange? You know, first, you know, in psychiatry, you always speak 
well, like you said, oh, the child is behaving strange. Then I'm going to tell you, tell me more about this strange behavior. So what what the child does, except like oh, not except, to uh, he, he doesn't want to go to school. I think this is the first thing. Okay, right? And yeah, and, and not not apparently normal, but okay. uh, only not going school phobia maybe. I think something like okay. that. Okay, it could be no. It, it could be school. It's not really on also only school phobia. Also called separation anxiety, which is a big. How old is the child? Uh, he's like. Uh, four years or something. Okay, so in, in, in that case, in that case, like you know, we get a lot of separation anxiety. Although the if the child is going to school, but now stay back at home, right? And then, of course, the child is hearing about COVID. People are dying. People are this. People are that. The child has getting anxious, and and also think that oh, I, if I leave home, maybe I'm thinking that if the I will leave home, I when I come back, I'm not going to find my parents. Or if I go out, I'm going to get sick and I'm going to die. It looks like separation anxiety, also anxiety together, and of course it it, it can be it can be uh, you know um, it can be the child can be helped with therapy and then you know with slow a slow transition to school you know instead of saying like one day just you know just go to school and then that's it huh? it can be slowly uh, you know start let's see the child is having problem the way we do it here the child is having problem go to school let's see. Mom, I'm going to take this child to school for one hour and then come back. And, and little by little, like, you know, we can increase the time back. And then mom, eventually mom can stay home. Mom can leave the child to school and come back home. And child needs to be talked about that we are here. We love you. When you come back, you're going to be here. When you go to school, the teacher is going to take care of you. Nothing going to happen to you. You know, there's, you get to, you know, play with your uh, friends and get to see other, 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 you know, other things at school. It's slowly, but it's not going to happen in one day. It looks like both anxiety and separation anxiety put together. Thank you. You're welcome. Uh, there's a question on the chat from Dr. Sultana. Okay. For adolescent patients, should we consider counseling or should we start medicine and counseling together? Okay. So, um, yeah, it's a good, very good questions. So, depending on the case, right? Uh, let's see if the child is coming with anxiety, right? And um, we interview, of course, we interview the child and everything. We find out what the trigger and the child is suffering just for anxiety. We don't want to give medication. We, we, we send the child for therapy and, and we take from them. And let's see if the child is still not functioning with therapy and having a lot of phobias, like uh, not going out, not not talking to anybody, not not uh, you know not doing well at school. Maybe you can start like tiny dose of medication, but we never start medication first. It's always first therapy and counseling, and then it doesn't work. Then we also combine medication with it. Any other question? You can write. Uh, excuse me. Very rare. To excuse me, Ram, I have a one question to you. Sure. Uh, May I ask one question? Sure, sure. Hello, hear me? Yeah. Go ahead. Uh, uh, thank you uh, for your uh, nice uh, deliberation. Actually, my question is, what are the main challenges for children and family service, uh, in, uh, especially in collecting data from parents, uh, those who are from uh, uh, low socioeconomic condition, that is disadvantaged uh, conditions? Okay, so many times they don't want to like, you know, parents don't want to, you know, many, many times like, you know, we, we get to see pa parents, they have their own issues, like they have mental illness, they have substance abuse issue, they have like, you know, um, child abuse, neglect case, this many times they don't want to disclose that to you many times. And then we get to find a different way, like, you know, when you're a psychiatrist, you have to be a little detective too, like, like you have to say, I don't trust anybody. The child is, has that much history and no, nothing there, no. Let me dig into it more. So we have, we have, like, we have the luxury to uh, call the school. We, we can find out if there's the ACS, meaning the Child Protective Services, and we can, we can dig into it. But it, it's a big challenge. Many times, oh, no, 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 everything's fine. The child is, you know, just doing that. Yeah. And also, it's not only no social treatment, especially, Ah, my big challenge, you know who? The Bangladeshi patient. Oh my God, <laughs> they don't want to say anything. Big, big, especially about um, uh, abuse. 
sexual abuse, they're never going to, because I, I, I had patient who was sexual abused by, you know, uh, uncle. The family was not cooperative. We had to find it from the uh, detective and, and ACS worker. So they, they don't want to disclose any, and, and, and if this, especially the child, let's see, when the child come here or child is born here, we, we, have, we have more access to school and everything, but if the child is coming, let's see, an adolescent year, and we don't know what happened in back home. Those are like big challenges for me, like, you know, for us. They're not gonna, you know, disclose all the thing or what people are gonna think, what the family name gonna be, you know, those kind of things. I think the same thing is with Pakistani families also. Same. I, I'm, I'm talking about even Chinese. I mean, exactly. all South Asian countries are like that. Very, very, you know, very all about what people are going to think. It's not what my, my child, uh, you know, going to get help. It's not that what people are going to think, what my, you know, family going to think, those kind of things. This is a good question. Keep coming yeah come yes yeah, i'm here <laughs> as i was yeah. saying before it's very rare to get a child psychiatrist because it's it's a very uh, difficult field so many people don't go into child psychiatry so it's very difficult you know i have i have stories like oh yeah so i also like this is the first time that that's why i'm like you know it's unscripted unplugged like you can say that we are talking about all those things but next time if if i get invited again maybe i can i can ask the um uh, ask you guys what you like special topic let's see you want to d discuss about bipolar or you want to discuss about schizophrenia then i can go like more details on those things but today i think it's it's, it's better to ask with the overview about child psychiatry so we can we can you know focus on something later there's a question from Dr. Romano. How are we dealing with children who need therapy online now, but have no access okay. to internet? So at home? here, like all, everybody has a, uh, who, who has a um, doctor, they, they, they have the access for their, their schedule, right? Let's see, I'm all, if I'm working outpatient clinic, and if, I'm, uh, if I have to uh, see the patient every two weeks or twice a week, I schedule the program for the new patient. I mean, you cannot directly get the help online, but you have to have a doctor who's going to prescribe you therapy, prescribe you medication, or prescribe you services here. So we always schedule. Even even like for example, I'm I like I said I work in inpatient unit. We are not allowing um, initially for many many months. We didn't allow uh, visits because of the COVID. So we did um, FaceTime with the with the family. So regularly FaceTime. Now we do like we started opening up a little bit. I think we're gonna close again. So one person at a time, one one parent once a week, and uh, the, and then we um, we watch the parents if they're wearing masks, if the child is wearing masks, things like that. But you cannot here, you cannot go direct help. But of course, you need a doctor who can prescribe you help online. Uh, online, and it's not that bad. You can easily get it. But you need a provider to do, do so for you. So, what would you do if there is no internet at home? Um, so, I mean, everybody has a phone here. So, I mean, any any phone, they, we use iPhone or whatever. And, and you know, people has home. I mean, phone. Everybody has phone. So, we can do that. There's a question from Dr. Sultana. What may be the predisposing factors for adolescent depression? Okay, um, so it's, it's a very good question. It could be anything. Yeah. Let's see, um, it could be substance abuse. Uh, of, of course, this could be genetical, like, you know, somebody was depressed that, you know, in the family that, and then it, it put the child to get depressed, you know. And depression, like, um, it could be any, anything, like, but not, like I said, you have to, you have to diagnose depression the time period, right? Let's say I'm depressed, I broke up with my boyfriend and I'm depressed. That's not, not a diagnosis of major depressive disorder, right? That can be um, handled if the child is not functioning because of that, that can be handled outpatient clinic with therapy or so, right? But for example, major depressive disorder, when you diagnose that, it could, that, I mean, 
it has to be like the mood depressed mood more than two weeks, all those like, you know, anhedonia, not sleeping, not eating, not being engaged in guilty feelings, all those things, then you diagnose childhood depression, right? So the, the predisposing factor is, could be triggered, could be anything can happen. Let's say you lost a family member, that could be a trigger for the depression, right? You, you, you lost your boyfriend, uh, that could be a trigger for it. As some, and something happened to you and you get uh, abused and you're using substance, those kind of things. But main predisposing, of course, family is still the number one predisposing, right? Yeah. Same, same with suicide, like the way we, we assess suicide, um, was the risk factor, mentioned previous suicidal attempt is the number one risk factor for having another suicidal attempt, same way. A uh, question for everyone, for future topics, uh, what uh, topic on psychiatry would you want Dr. Alam for future? If you could uh, write it out, we can uh, arrange that for the future. Um, I don't see anything. I'm sure we can get more information. Um, sure. uh, there's another question from Dr. Fahim Iqbal approach to diagnosing common psychiatric illness in children and adolescent. Approach to diagnosing common psychiatric illness in children and adolescent. Okay. So, um, another question is maybe how to specifically deal with Bangladesh Asian parent societies on psych issues. Okay. So, so um, think, okay, go ahead. Uh, Ma'am, okay, uh, can I say something? I just sure. I wanted to uh, sir say that uh, the topic we are interested to for for, for next, uh, how how what approach we can take okay. to diagnose like common illnesses. So sure, sure. this sure, I, thing. I got it. Yeah. And another thing I wanted to ask it uh, that uh, do you, do you think that the percentage of psychiatric uh, patients uh, is more in children or in adult? If you okay. like, compare, so, yeah. Thank you. So let let's see. Young people, right? Let's see, I'm like 14 to 25 years old. What is the most common men illness? It's mental illness because people 14 to 24, 25, they're all healthy, right? They don't really go to the doctor for anything. So we get to see they come with like anxiety, depression, things like that, right? So th this is a very common thing. And most of the mental illness in adults, like, you know, 50% starts at the age of 14. Okay, when they're young, let's see a schizophrenic is, is a 25 year old, old schizophrenic or 25 year old um, depressed man. If you go back to the history, you'll see when they're 14, they had issues, right? So basically that's why if we can recognize the sign and symptom, if we can see, see the, um, you know, uh, alert um, or, you know, alarm, whatever you say, or if you can, um, if you can, uh, you know, intervene, and uh, with the child with all those, let's say, depression or behavior issues, we can we can actually reduce those things. We can uh, have better outcome from it. So, when they're fourteen, of course they're gonna have. If, if the patient has, uh, you know, um, I I want to say, the adult has mental illness. Basically, they start it when they're very young. There's a question, maybe you can answer this now. What may be the approach in management of adolescent patients with suicidal or self-harming tendencies? Okay, so um, it's a very good question and very also, it's a what question, let's see suicide. What does it mean suicide, all right? So when you assess a patient for suicidality, uh, we have to be very careful how you ask the question, excuse me. <clears throat> For example, um, 14 year old female came to the emergency room following a suicidal attempt by 15 Tylenol, right? So you have, to, you have to find out how serious it is, right? So when you ask the patient, you, you need to find out why did you take only 15 pills? What was your goal? right? Who found you? Who did you see that you took the, you know, took 15 pills? How come you didn't take something else with 15 pills? Right? Those kind of things. So um, sometimes patient has like, especially the borderline personality female is very common. 
they'll tell you, oh, I took 15 year, uh, 15 uh, Tylenol and I went to my mom and I said, I took 15 Tylenol. No witness, right? So you have to be careful if, the, if you want to if you want to watch the child in the AER for a few days or you want to admit the child in the inpatient unit, right? Of course, you're gonna, you have to find out if the child has any real attempt, right? In the past or not. This one, I had, I had a patient when I was a resident. So I, and I was in second year resident. You know, when you're second year, you're just learning, right? So there's a patient who was brought to the emergency room after taking two pill of Tylenol and child was hiding in the park. And somebody found the child and then took the child to the police and they took, the, you know, brought the child to the hospital. So when I asked to the child, why did you take two pills? And the child thought she will be dead and she still want to die. See the motive? Like she took it and she thought she's gonna die and she's, she's very upset that she didn't die. So this is very serious. So I'm also, sec I'm also like second year resident. I'm thinking, should I admit the child or discharge the child? So I have to discuss that with my attending. And then they say, of course, you're gonna admit the child. The child wants to die. It doesn't matter what she did, right? Look how she did. She took the two, two pills she was hiding in the park and she didn't tell anybody, right? And then same, same token, I, I have a patient, oh, I took 30 pills of this. And is there any symptoms of like, you know, medical symptoms? No, no nausea, no vomiting, no dizziness, nothing. The child is saying that she, she took 30 pills and she told her mom that, or her brother that, right? So see, see the, how you have to like, you know, make sure. And, this, and then also like self-abusive children, sometimes they think they can just cut a little bit, they're gonna die. So you have to ask, why do you do that? And also sometimes they're gonna say, oh, I, I cut not to die. I just, I just cut because when I, I want to feel that I, if, I, if, I, if, if I'm still alive or I have anxiety when I cut, when I see blood, I feel relaxed. So, you know, it's, it's very, very like, you know, very, um, you have to be very careful. It's a very serious question. So, you know, and then uh, let's say the child is cut, cutting all the time, not necessarily like the child is saying that I'm not suicidal, I'm just cutting because I was angry, I'm cutting because I was anxious, I'm cutting because it feels good when I cut, then the ch you can do outpatient, you know, outpatient therapy. And of course you need to find if the child is having like depression or anxiety or anything else with it, okay? And of course the suicidal one always get admitted in the inpatient unit and you can monitor and you can treat depression or anxiety with, uh, with suicidal, you know, suicidal thoughts. And you always have to take suicidal thoughts seriously. It doesn't matter, like, you know, it's always why, who, how, who found you, who you were hiding it, did you tell anybody? So you'll understand what is the child is thinking about, right? It's not that how many, how many I took. I took one pill, I, th I thought I'm gonna die. You know, like that. Any other questions? Uh, Dr. Alam, thank you. Uh, I, I have one question to you. Uh, before that, I want to say that uh, in our country, the domestic violence, as well as inequality, uh, in the adolescent group also may be one of the mental illness in our country. And mm -hmm. I have a question to you that uh, how would you um, counseling or treat the psychological aspect of a post-operative patients of older children? Those are like post-operative patients, it's a big operations. Like surgery? Oh, okay, so if they, like, like, you know, like many, surgery. Yeah, many times after surgery, patients also develop depression and anxiety. He, uh, so here, like basically, they usually get to see first by their uh, by their you know primary care, and they can refer them to you know therapy. You know, not necessary. You have to you know have medication, uh, therapy, and, and support support group. You know, they they can you know have like social worker or somebody can follow this person for sometimes. And if there's of course domestic violence, there's a lot of help here. I'm not sure how how but in Bangladesh, let's see. If the child, uh, if, if there is a child involved in that kind of then that kind of situation, the the mom is uh, having a big medical illness, but mom is also getting abused by them. Then uh, you know ACS gets involved there. Maybe child can be removed temporarily from the home to get better help, or you know, or sometimes if the dad is really really very uh, abusive, uh, it could be their way or mom. You know, the child always gets removed, and then uh, child doesn't go back home till those problem solved or somebody, you know, some legal, uh, you know, action being taken. Here, like, you know, I mean, 
uh, getting the services, even here also, like, you know, not everybody go for it. This is, you know, this mental illness is a stigma. Even here, people think, so uh, I'm not too weak. I don't, I don't need any help. Um, and many, many people, especially women, they don't want to acknowledge that, or oh, they are getting abused or they're getting, you know, um, by husband, boyfriend or partner. You know, not everybody wants to, you know, acknowledge that. You know, it takes time, but the same way, like, you know, when you cannot cheat a person when they're not saying uh, that, oh, I'm getting abused. Same way, when an alcoholic or substance abuse person, you cannot force them unless or until they're saying, oh, okay, my name is this and this, I have a problem. I, I smoke marijuana every day and that's, uh, you know, that's hampering my life. Or I drink every day and I'm, I'm, I'm having trouble, I need help. The same way. They have to, un unless the, the, the person was like severely beaten and then severely, you know, injured by the partner, you can remove them. Other than that, for help, they have to ask for it, you know. If they say, no, I don't need help, I'm fine with it. You know, you know, the better woman syndrome, it's like, you know, oh, the, the partner is beating you, hitting you, and then saying, I'm sorry, I'm not going to do that again. And they go back to the normal life again, and then it happens again. Any other questions? Thank you, madam. It was very nice. Uh, we can have a very wide angle analysis of psychiatric illnesses. Uh, mm -hmm. I wanted to ask uh, the ACR, hysteric conversion reaction. We see many patients in Bangladesh, like they come in the emergency department, yeah. young patients with HCR. Mm -hmm. What is the percentage of patients over there in USA? And mm -hmm. also, uh, do you think that the substance abuse like alcohol and other drugs is more in USA or like? Because we we we, saw, we see we see that in our country also in Bangladesh, uh, drug abuse, substance abuse is very rampant here. Yeah, I mean here it's, it's a very yeah it's very common like especially marijuana kids in, in school. Yeah, this they like it's rising, it's rising. It's rising you yeah, know? it's rising because see you see the society now is like it's totally it's a different kind of world because the technology because of you know. Uh, more access to you know social media, everything yeah. is rising. You know? Yeah, it's, it's it's tough. It's tough. Uh, what is the other question he said? The it's here, the history conversion reaction. Oh, I okay. Mean, so yeah, I mean it happens especially the person is borderline personality disorder. You get yeah. to see a lot of conversion. We have, um, um, for example, we see a lot of a lot of cases we call pseudo seizures, and you know patient uh, have. Um, have you know he, we call it hissy fit or you know a stereotype i i get to see um, i mean not that much but i i still and especially for the uh, children you don't get to see too much but the, for adults population you get to see a lot you know um uh, especially that the child uh, especially i mean for adults especially there is a like you know um conflict between how i'm feeling if i'm feeling depressed or or somebody is like, you know, abusing the person, but they don't know how to expect, they're gonna say, oh, I, I, I don't feel my um, arm, I don't feel my leg, because the attention, instead of say, instead of like focusing on their depression or anxiety, is focused on something else. Or maybe it's, it's a cry for help too sometimes, you know? You know, they, they can express, um, uh, you know, how, how to ask for help. So they can say, well, okay, let me have this kind of, I mean, they do it without knowing it, but there's a secondary gain, you know? Yeah, to to get attention for help or get just the attention, you know, it's it's it's, it's very common in borderline personality. Also, I forgot to tell you something. Um, like when you take history, especially in the page, you know, the culture, you have to be culturally sensitive. Um, there's many many. Um, um, th there's a like Southeast Asian clinic in Manhattan. So many times I used to get patient during my resident years to refer to me because I speak Bengali. Uh, because of like, you know, things they call in, in lost in translation. Let's see, many patients when they are um, depressed, they, instead of saying uh, that I'm feeling depressed, I'm feeling that they, they might say like, you know, uh, my chest, I'm going book, book jolly. Manglai bulli book jolly, right? So, je translate kollo, shekin tu book jolly, translate kintu kollo je or Okay, maybe you have some kind of, you know, um, a, a guard or something like that. Depression, 
তারপরে চিটাগাঙ্গিয়ান একটা پیشنট ছিল আমার সে বলে প্যাট পরের ওরা কিন্তু মন খারাপ কি বলে প্যাট পরের তো ওকে প্যাট পরের মনে করে তো সে মিলিয়ন ডলারস ওয়ার্ক আপ হয়ে গেল সব আপার জিআই কিন্তু পরে দেখলো যে پیشنট ডিফারেন্ট ডিফারেন্ট সো ইউ হ্যাভ টু বি ইউ নো ভেরি সেনসিটিভ ওকে সো ইউ ইউ জাস্ট ইজ burning so for how long why how if there any problem eating if there any any regurgitation have anything like that you know you have to be very careful it's, it sounds funny but you know you have to be careful when you assess a patient regarding those especially in a country like here and maybe bangladesh is hote pare bangladesh is that apni je jodi patient jodi bolte na pare je amar mon kharap hocche amar bhuk jolche আমার মন কাঁদে আমার পেট জ্বলছে এরকম তাহলে তো ওই রকম পার্টিসিপেটিং and thank you dr alam for your wonderful thank you i i hope you it was a little helpful for you guys so you know you can comment whatever thank right. you thank you okay have a good day everybody thank you have a good day okay